Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. I, Maya, um, are, is incredibly honored <laughs> to introduce Alenka Zupancic, um, who's a Lacanian philosopher and social theorist. She is a professor at the University uh, European Graduate School. Um, as well, she is a research advisor and professor at the uh, Institute of Philosophy at the Research Center of Slovenian Academy of Science and Arts. Sorry, it's a mouthful. Alenka is the author of the following books: The Odd One In on Comedy by uh, MIT Press, um, Why Psychoanalysis: Three Interventions. The Shortest Shadow, Nietzsche's Philosophy of the Two, and my personal favorite, Ethics of the Real, Kant and the Con. Um, without further ado. Uh, thank you very much, and of course, thank, uh, I would like to thank also the organizers who put this whole thing together and placed it in this place as well. It's also my first time in, in India. So I will uh, begin with a kind of uh, apology, namely, if it does matter at all, the abstract that you, you had, the title has changed. Uh, so when I was uh, writing the abstract, I was thinking in terms of how actually the very word economy is used or referred to within capitalist economy as a kind of internal, uh, that there was a kind of interesting redoubling. Uh, uh, and the way the, the word itself or the concept itself it's not only it's not only capitalist economy, but the way capitalism refers to economy as its essential uh, constituent is kind of an interesting thing to pursue. But actually, I did not pursue this thread. Instead, I focused on another economy, uh, which, to some extent, at least, I say it's also very much pertinent for the analysis of capitalism, although it takes a kind of a broader shape or structure. And this would be the economy involved in the relationship, I would put it this way, in the relationship between repetition or repetitious continuation of something and ending, the end. And I think we could all agree that uh, the, uh, one of the reoccurring fantasies, I will just try to introduce this via the question of capitalism also, one of the reoccurring fantasies of late capitalism is precisely the fantasy of the end, with capital E even. Of course, to be sure, this fantasy of the end or this kind of apocalyptic expectations and so on uh, also existed prior to a capitalist world or outside it. Uh, but I think it could be instructive to look at the way it, it is structured in capitalism as well as to look at the shift uh, in this structuring precisely. And of course, one particular shift is especially interesting in this respect, uh, namely the shift that took place at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, and is emblem, uh, emblematized at the ideological level by Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History. And my first suggestion, which I think is quite obvious, would be that this book, what this book marks, to some extent is the opposite of what it seems to suggest, namely that we have finally reached the end. What it marks is quite contrary, the impossibility to end, namely the impossibility to end capitalism or the impossibility for capitalism to come for an end. The history is over, but this kind of trans-historical formation will continue. So the context in which Fukuyama's book was written is, of course, clear and closely related to what could be simply described as the disappearance of all real outside to, to capitalism. The end of Cold War, uh, the end of really existing socialism as precisely existing outside and alongside capitalist order, marking its boundary it, this now translates into a kind of open totality in which the outside, the remaining non-democratic, let's say, regimes, is on its way to the inside, or is, we could say even that it is speculatively already included in the inside. Uh, and this inside is all there is, or all there could be. 
In other words, the end of history means that we have reached a point and are living in times which cannot end, at least not of any intrinsic or dialectical reasons. This is basically the story. And I think this, in turn, plays an important part in how the fantasy of an end, if we want to think of an end, is structured nowadays. It can only come from the outside, but whereby this outside now basically means something like a natural universe. Uh, as opposed, let's say, to historical universe. And it usually involves more or less a total destruction of the Earth, like the Earth will be hit by a comet or something like this. Or if not total destruction of Earth, then at least the extinction of the very natural or biological basis of humankind. So the only end inside, the, the only thing, way we can think of an end of capitalism, is the end of the world, or the end of the Earth, or at least of the human. Um, and I think we must not fail to see to what extent, for example, the intended emancipatory aspect of the idea of the post-human post actually kind of endorses Fukuyama and the end of history thesis, or some version of it. So the image of an alternative is finally an image of a radical end, and not, for example, of a split, uh, divergence, struggle, or something like this. Um, and just two more points to introduce this. In, in the past decades, uh, this capitalist incredible and suffocating resilience has often been remarked and commented upon, namely its capacity to turn all contradictions and resistances into its own advantage, to kind of explore its weakest points, and to literally feed on these contradictions. There is no way out because whatever way out one thinks of, it is immediately deactivated and appropriated on the inside. This was the kind of diagnosis. Um, however, I would add that this no way out should not be confused precisely with the non-existence of an outside. And my kind of introductory claim, which hopefully will become more clear at the end, would be to suggest that the idea of the end, this capital end, as realistic as it may well be, actually functions precisely as an ideological fantasy screen that obfuscates the difference between these two things, or these two levels, the, the, just to repeat the two levels. First, the fact that capitalism fits and pro prospers by appropriation and exploitation of its own contradictions, I would claim is not exactly new, but is built in in its very being from the, from the outset. The second point, the, the historical disappearance of the outside to capitalist order, it's not the same, I think, and should not be taken as one with its reliance on internal contradiction or this non-relation that we were talking about yesterday. So the fact, very simply put, the fact that at present there exists no symbolic other or symbolic outside to capitalism is, I claim, a historical contingency which can, in principle, change. There is nothing in capitalism to prevent it from occurring like ontologically, although obviously there is a lot to prevent it ideologically and materially. In other words, capitalism is changing uh, all the time, but we should kind of not take this as uh, co condescend to the two levels. And I think what I was suggesting is simply this, that this uh, fantasy of an end, of the end, is a way to condescend or to, to um, fuse the two. So now, in what follows, I will focus more directly on this question of the relationship of perpetuation of something and of its ending. And I will propose kind of a two modes of this relationship. So I will not so much speak directly of capitalism, also although of it, uh, but we'll try to propose a kind of a more general scheme and we'll return to this at the end. So the claim, the first claim would be simply that, of course, we should not conceive of the end as something that simply ends the repetition or repetitive perpetuation of something, but is the end essentially presupposed by or as perpetuated by the repetition itself. 
this at least will be the case of these two modes and the economy involved in these two modes of the relationship. So the first modality, to put it very simply in a kind of a more anecdotic way, the first modality of the relationship between repetition and ending, uh, we could put it under the following heading. I can end it whenever I want. This would be the kind of subjective uh, encapsulation of it. And I'm sure we are all familiar with this kind of configuration where the possibility of ending what we are doing or repeating is the very condition of its repetition. Be it a bad relationship or like reoccurring scenes, difficulties, a bad habit, not having the strength or to end it strictly correlates to the possibility, what we conceive or think of as possibility of ending it, that we could have done it. Uh, and of course, possibility is a crucial term here. It is precisely what allows us not to act or not to end it in this case. Why bother now? It can wait, we can see, and so on. <coughs> the possibility is sufficient. And if you want a nice comic example of, of this logic, is provided actually one of the episodes of uh, Monty Python's the, the Meaning of Life. And I'm speaking of the episode uh, which starts with this famous Every Sperm is Sacred song, where this huge, huge Catholic family, they have like literally 50, 50 kids or something like this. They dance and they kind of sing this song, Every Sperm is Sacred. And then the, uh, the perspective shifts to a Protestant couple, observing them through, through the window and commenting on these bloody Catholics, as the husband puts it. Um, and so, but why do they have so many children, as, asks the wife. And the husband re, uh, re, uh, answers, because every time they have sexual intercourse, they have to have a baby. The wife is confused. But it's the same with us. We have two children and we have sexual intercourse twice. That's not the point, retorts the husband. We could have had it any time we wanted. So then the scene goes on and the husband brags about how their religion allows them to use condoms, even such that enhance pleasure. Have you got one? asks the wife. Well, no, but I can go down the road any time I want, walk into Harris's, and hold my head up high and say in a loud, steady voice, Henry, I want you to send me a condom. In fact, today I'll have a French tickler, for I'm a Protestant. And then the wife goes, well, why don't you? So, so you see, it's the, precisely this kind of uh, logic where the possibility to, to do something or to stop something or whatever can be precisely what makes us get involved and perpetuate precisely the thing that we are supposed to do or not to do. And of course, the fact that the end is structured here as a possibility makes this interrogation part of a larger one. And some of you know the book very well. He's in his recently published book, Abolishing Freedom, uh, Frank Ruda actually takes up this in relation to the issue of freedom. That, namely, that freedom as possibility as capacity or as potentiality, as exemplified precisely in the freedom of choice, this kind of a, uh, liberal democratic capitalist mantra, that this is actually the best antidote to actual freedom. That freedom as possibility, as capacity, has become a signifier of oppression precisely, both social and economic. And which Ruda proposes to counteract with what he calls comic fatalism. And he formulates several slogans of such fatalism, some of which directly evoke the idea of the end as well. This is why I also think it's interesting in relation to what I'm saying. Um, they suggest that a way out of this freedom as oppression is to act as if the end has already happened. This is basically his uh, metrics. Act as if the apocalypse has already happened act as if you were dead, act as if everything were always already lost, and so on. Uh, so we could say, if you want to end a bad relationship, act as if you have already ended it. Or this perhaps works even better. If you want to stop smoking, act as if you have already stopped, and kind of declare retroactively that the cigarette you smoked 
half an hour ago was actually your last one. So when uh, accentuating the mode of possibility or potentiality as the main problem, as the very ideological core of the problem in this kind of configuration, we should be nevertheless careful, I think, to add and stress one more thing. Namely, that once the possibility enters the game and structures it, structures freedom, one should resist understanding or presenting the stakes simply in terms of possibility versus actuality, or possibility versus realization of this possibility. For this opposition is precisely how freedom as oppression work, works in practice. It works following the logic of the superego, very concisely defined by, by Slavoj, as the reversal of the Kantian, this Kantian, you must, therefore you can, into you can, therefore you must. So there is this kind of shift, uh, not, no longer, okay, if it, you, if it needs to be done, you, even if it's unhumanly difficult, you have to do it, you can do it, into this, okay, there is this possibility, you can do it, and then immediately upon the possibility, what follows upon it is this kind, but you must. Possibilities are here to be taken, to be realized by all means and at any price. You can do it, therefore you must. So the, the culture and economy of possibilities is not suffocating simply because there are so many possibilities and that it's hard to choose between, but precisely because we are also supposed somehow not to miss out on any of them. Of course, person who just sits at home, relishing in the idea of all the possibilities and opportunities capitalism has to offer, and doing nothing to realize them is not the, the kind of ideal person that uh, the, the system needs. Um, what we are expected is to realize these possibilities, but never to question the framework of these possibilities as possibilities, precisely. Which is, I, I would say, where the actual freedom has to be situated, not simply in the realization of these possibilities, but in kind of unscrewing the very framework based on the idea of freedom as possibility to be realized. Okay, and just to make this point perhaps even more clear, um, we can return to this Protestant couple from the meaning of life uh, and say that they are certainly not ideal customers, uh, consumers, sorry. Uh, they are not, we could say they are not yet caught into the superego imperative of enjoyment. They just relish this possibility. Uh, what they and our reaction to them expose, I think it's precisely the, the risk of this swift conclusion which consolidates uh, precisely the capitalist logic, namely the following conclusion. Were they to act on these possibilities, then they, uh, then they have or they would have been really free, or really whatever they want to be, which of course is not the case. In other words, what I want to say is that the problem is not that they don't act, but although they could have, but rather that, uh, uh, that if they were, even if they were to act, this act would have already been caught up in this logic of freedom as realization of possibilities. Logic on which themselves and their freedom have very little influence. But nevertheless, the way the example functions in the movie, and this is what mostly interests me here, it's in the first place to illustrate the logic of the relationship precisely between repetition and the ending that I started with. They can go on, we could put it simply this way, they can go, uh, can go on practicing their puritanism because they believe they can end it whenever they want. Uh, so there is a certain economy, psychological economy, little arrangements with oneself at work between uh, in this mode of re uh, relationship, our repeating something and the possibility of ending it. There is clearly an economy here an economy that allows me, for example, I will keep using this example for different reasons, to go on smoking while the possibility of quitting is here just in order to help me to smoke, so to say. How many people would start smoking if the state, instead of putting warnings, threats, and these disgusting images on cigarette packs, 
would pass a law stating that if you start smoking, you can never end, you can never stop, you can never quit, ever. It's just you sign up to it and that's it. Once you start, you commit to it for life. Uh, so the structure that we are dealing with here in this first mode of relationship between repetition and ending could thus be, defi thus be defined as follows. We are infinitely approaching the end as the limit, putting it off, yet this limit is not simply there at the end of it, as it seems to be, but is as a possibility, as potentiality, also the very precondition of the movement of repetition, of continuation. What is certain, it is also what structures it. Um, it, is also, it is also what buys us the freedom to enjoy whatever we are doing. It structures the enjoyment of ending it as well. For we must not overlook that the enjoyment here is not simply the, on the side of smoking. It is at least as much the enjoyment in the postponing of the end as a kind of absolute enjoyment. So there is an economy at stake here, but it is not, I would say, the only possible kind, and perhaps even not the most interesting kind. So the other mode of the relationship between repetition and ending that I will be discussing now in more, at more length, I guess it's even more interesting. And this other mode, I would put it under the following heading, this is the end, this is the last time I do it. And in order to exemplify this logic, I will introduce a literary reference, namely a novel by Italo Svevo, La Conscienza di Zeno. Uh, Zeno's conscious is uh, English translation, at least one of the two. Uh, this novel was written in uh, 1923. And this Svevo, which is a pseudonym, was an Italian writer and businessman, also living in Trieste, also a close friend of James Joyce, who is in fact responsible for the deserved fame of this novel, which passed very much unnoticed when it was published. So Zeno's conscience wonderfully depicts another possible kind of economy at stake in the relationship between repetition and ending. And the key word here, to continue with the example of cigarettes, which are actually at the center of the novel as well. The key word here is not sometime, but not just now, I will quit smoking, but this cigarette right here and now is the last cigarette I will smoke. So this kind of a ritual. The ultima cigaretta, it's kind of repeating mantra. And of course, as Zeno remarks, to better underline one's inner resolve, one likes to end smoking together with the end of something else as well, like the end of the month or the end of the year or something like this. So there is kind of repetition directly uh, implicit in this ending as well. Um, so of course, nothing tastes as good as the ultima cigaretta. And this is also what Zeno says. He says, I believe the taste of a cigarette is more intense when it is your last. So the fact that it is the last cigarette adds something to its taste, it makes it the best cigarette ever, and it makes you really enjoy it. So of course the ideal or the idea would be to think of every cigarette you smoke as of your last one and enjoy it accordingly. However, of course, and here's the catch, in order for this to work, you really have to believe that it is your last one, that this is the end. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So in other words, you have to be a neurotic, and Zeno, the main character of the novel, certainly is. And the economy at stake here is not that of kind of literal arrangement with oneself in the sense of the previous economy. In terms of the economy of enjoyment, uh, you cannot, I would say, help yourself by acting as if this were your last cigarette. You cannot say to yourself, I will act as if this uh, is my last cigarette and this way I get to enjoy it more. You want to stop, you do everything in your power to stop, and Zeno really goes to some extremes here, but you end up accumulating one last cigarette after another, that is you end up infinitely repeating the end, and enjoying it rather against your will. So strictly speaking, the economy here is unconscious economy, or even more precisely, we could say it is the economy of the unconscious. 
So no wonder that then that Zeno's consciousness is actually a novel about psychoanalysis to some extent. The, the novel consists actually of Zeno's memoirs uh, in which his obsession with smoking, um, with his health and his obsession of quitting, he really wants to quit smoking and he cannot, He's in analysis for it, and this plays a very prominent part in, in, in the book. And as we read in the preface, um, allegedly written by analysts to whom Zeno sent his memoirs at some point, uh, it's literally there in the introduction, in the preface, the analyst decides to publish the memoirs in revenge because Zeno has suspended treatment at some point. So this is a kind of a framework, but it really doesn't matter. I mean, it's not important for my, my argument. So differently from this uh, previous configuration in which the end as possibility was inherent to the repetition, what is at stake here is rather that I would say a repetition is inherent to the end. There is something about the end itself that drives the repetition. And repetition is essentially repetition of an end. Uh, so I will now quickly go a little bit through, through, through Zeno and his logic. I mean, other things could be said following this logic, but so Zeno is very skeptical about his uh, analysis, how it goes, uh, about what it can achieve, and he's also very skeptical about his doctor, his analyst. But this doctor seems to get at least some things right. And one of them is that Zeno's disease was not simply the smoking itself, as Zeno thinks, but precisely his obsession with ending it. Or rather that smoking and quitting are actually one and the same passion for him. So perhaps the real question is not why does he smoke so much, but rather why does he want to stop to end it so badly? And I think the core of Zeno's pathology in all its comic dimension lies here and not simply in his smoking as he and to some extent also his doctor thinks. So at some point the doctor tries a new strategy. It doesn't work and he tries a new strategy telling Zeno that actually there is no reason for him to stop. Uh, I will just read you two sentences from the book. Uh, this is Zeno's account of this ses analytic session. He said, these are his words. Smoking wasn't bad for me. And if I were convinced it was harmless, it would really be so. A little bit further, that day I left the doctor's house smoking like a chimney. So, you know, this kind of, uh, the doctor also serves him a kind of full explanation why Zeno thinks the smoking is bad for him and blah, 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 blah. But what is interesting, I think, for me, what interests me here particularly, is that the doctor's suggestion that smoking isn't bad for him aims at disrupting both possible economies involved in the relationship between repetition and ending that I'm discussing. Not only the urgency, the imperative to stop immediately, but also the perspective of the possibility to stop at some later point. So what doctor imposes upon Zeno with his intervention is the absolute freedom to smoke, which throws out not only the imperative to end, but also the cause that structures the framework of the smoking in terms of the possibility of ending it. So here we have now no end in sight, and no end to repeat, nor to infinitely approach. And this changes the configuration radically, as, and as it could be expected, affects Zeno badly. He goes on smoking like a chimney for a while, and then he concludes the freedom to smoke whenever I liked finally depressed me totally. I had a good idea, I went to Dr. Paoli. Now, Dr. Paoli is a true doctor, not a shrink, a physician, and Zeno, Zeno desperately wants him to find some physical cause for his neurotic state, a real disease instead of an imaginary one, as he puts it. But Dr. Paoli is not of much help. He finds no physical disease that would relieve Zeno. But then, to cut the, the long story short, Zeno eventually finds a way out of his ordeal, this kind of absolute freedom that he finds so oppressing. Uh, he never returns to analysis, and hence effectively ends it. 
not in any solemn way, just postpones going there. And after a while, he realizes that he has ended it. And in doing this, he also stops smoking. He says, I have finally succeeded in returning to my sweet habits and stopped smoking. I'm already much better since I have been able, this is literally in the book, I have been able to abolish the freedom that foolish doctor chose to grant me. So it's actually the, the, the title of Ruda's book, Abolishing Freedom, appears uh, literally in this uh, sentence. He abolished the freedom that that foolish doctor granted him. And this could be a nice example to, to add to, to Ruda's list. So the doctor's suggestion, you are free to smoke, efficiently exposes, we could say, the, the, this kind of limits of the abstract freedom, in this case, the impossibility masked by the false alternative or false choice between smoking and not smoking. For this choice is clearly not what is at stake for Zeno. He is repeating the very failure of this alternative to kind of capture, uh, the, the alternative fails to capture what is at stake for him precisely. So the imperative to smoke and the imperative to quit smoking come from the same source, from the same structural place, and they efficiently protect each other and, we could say, sustain the core of repression. So in, perhaps in a similar way that the abstract freedom of choice is the very form of existence of an imperative. The freedom to choose between different products is the form of the existence of the imperative to buy, for instance, we could put it this way. But anyway, so, but as we will see at the end, this might be a little bit problematic. Um, also in terms, I think, one other example of this um, Oh, okay, I will, we will discuss this later. So let's just follow Zeno a little bit more. He believes that it was not the therapy, but the fact that he ended it that finally cured him. This is what he concludes, and to some extent we could say he is right. But perhaps not uh, far from simply casting W's light on the practice of analysis leading to this ending, the fact that he was miraculously cured the moment he stopped going to analysis is perhaps a kind of case of a successful analysis. This is at least one possible reading, and I will give also an alternative one. But one reading would be to say that Zeno's obsession with ending, the idea that he has to stop smoking, has been kind of successfully transformed into transference neurosis. You know, this is the way transference neurosis is uh, described by Freud is that it is a kind of direct continuation of the whatever inaugural uh, illness with all the characteristics and symptoms of the inaugural illness except that since it is acted out in relationship to the analyst and in this kind of controlled environment it is uh, accessible to analytic intervention. You intervene in this artificial situation, but by doing this, you also manage to intervene in what, uh, where, at, at, at the point where this whole thing kind of started. So, and this could be, I think, to some extent, at least read in this way, that this is what happens to, to Zeno. He stops his analysis, and as if most naturally, he stops smoking, or rather he stops ending it, and hence stops doing it. He ends smoking by ending something else to which his passion for ending became attached. He could not have ended it directly by simply fully carrying through his original desire or attempt to end it. He needed to this other thing in order to end the first thing. So this would be one reading. But however, if we just kind of stay with the novel, Zeno memoirs continue and the con concluding part, and this is really the last entry, I mean the last uh, paragraphs of the book, it introduces a new perspective, which I think forces us to ask whether this, what I just suggested, is really the right reading, or is it rather than Zeno's ending, his analysis, was a showcase of what is called an acting out, and not a successful analysis. Now what is acting out? It is a very interesting concept in uh, psychoanalysis. It refers to the way in which uh, subject kind of stages, performs, acts out the very core 
of his or her symptom in a flagrant way, but without noticing it. It's right there in front of our eyes, but it, some, for some bizarre reason, the person is not aware what is going on. And actually, Lacan gives a very, very nice example of uh, this acting out in one of his écrits, where he anal uh, actually comments on uh, uh, some other analysis, and he comments on a mistake that this analyst made, who had the patient who actually was obsessed with uh, plagiarism. He could not write his book because whenever he started, he had immediately this idea that he was stealing ideas from others. So he could not write, he was completely inhib inhibited by this kind of uh, plagiarism uh, obsession. And so this other doctor, who obviously was not an Lacanian, and uh, he was trying to kind of get to the bottom of the thing and explain to this person why he has these feelings. And at some point, the doctor is convinced that he cured him. And uh, immediately upon this solution proposed by the doctor, uh, the patient or the subject makes this remark. I will just read this remark. He says, you know, every noon when I leave here, when I leave your uh, analyst's office, before luncheon and before returning to my office, I walk through this street, street well known for its small attractive restaurants, and I look at the menus in the windows. In one of the restaurants, I usually find my preferred dish, fresh brains. Actually, you see, this is a kind of really kind of very clear example of what is acting out and the fact that the subject does not hear at all what he's saying, and even worse, the analyst doesn't hear what he's saying. It's a kind of, uh, for Lacan, clear, clearly indicates that the core of repression, after all the explanations that have been served, remains fully operative. And as a matter of fact, I think the concluding part of the memoirs of a now supposedly cured Zeno, Zeno at least thinks he's cured, the doctor doesn't agree, so I think he's right. Uh, this, the concluding part, and this is, I think this is really the, where the interesting part comes in, contains a very similar configuration. In these last two paragraphs, actually, Zeno reflects on life in general and on the way it is heading and he produces this uh, reminiscence of how he predicts that sickness and the sick will prosper and flourish with the help of what he calls devices, these devices existing outside our body. These devices, he writes, are bought, sold and stolen, and man becomes increasingly shrewd and weaker. Uh, his first devices of man seemed extensions of his arm and couldn't be effective without its, uh, the, uh, the strength, our human strength. But by now, he says, the device no longer has any relation to the limb, and it is the device that creates sickness, abandoning the law of the strongest, and so the, uh, kind of we lost, he says, healthful selection. There is a kind of a very strong Nietzschean uh, tone in this last paragraph. Also. So Zeno goes on to suggest that it would take much more than psychoanalysis to cure this sickness. Actually, it would take no less than the unheard of catastrophe. It would take no less than the end of the world. And I will read you the really concluding paragraph, which is extremely nice. I mean, very point. He says, perhaps through an unheard of cat cat catastrophe, produced by devices, we will return to health. When poison gases no longer suffice, an ordinary, ordinary man in the uh, secrecy of a room in this world will invent an incomparable explosive compared to which the explosives currently in existence will be considered harmless toys. And another man, also ordinary, but a bit sicker than others, will steal this explosive and will climb up at the center of the earth to set it on the spot where it can have the maximum effect. There will be an enormous explosion that no one will hear, and the earth, once again a nebula, will wander through the heavens freed of parasites and sickness." End of quote. This, I would say, indeed, it is an illustrious acting out 
With respect to Zeno's inaugural obsession with precisely sickness and health and cigarettes as, as part of this obsession. And the fact that he may be right, I mean, on the factual level, I don't think changes uh, anything about this. So Zeno's obsession with health, sickness and ending it all reappears here on a whole new scale. It's no longer about quitting smoking, it's about the whole world uh, exploding. So what is particularly interesting about this conclusion is, I think, how it kind of strangely perfectly reson resonates with a lot of what we could call the intellectual climate of our times. I'm not sure if this is the same case here, but let's say the more Western hemisphere it definitely is. The theme of the end, of some kind of apocalypse or extinction, or at least the disappearance of what we call human beings, has a kind of imposing presence. The fact that there are real causes of concern here is in no way contradicts the often phantasmatic character of many of these representations of the end. And what I mean by this is that the idea of even the most radical or definite irreversible end usually serves as the framework through which we contemplate and interpret our present reality. This is what is phantasmatic about it. And it, is often, it often serves as a means of its ideological consolidation, precisely. It serves first to give us an idea of just how much is needed to change our present reality, that it is, provides a spectacular answer to the question, what does it have to end, what has to end in order for our present troubles to end? And from there, we can have our pick. We can either decide that we prefer nothing to change, since change and catastrophe are one and the same, or else we can find consolation in the fact that it will all be taken care of anyway by this global total catastrophe. And then perhaps something uh, new can begin, and this is a kind of optimist silver lining of the catastrophe scenarios as potential scenarios of emancipation, because very often they are presented also in these terms. Uh, so in this, is, this way I return to what I said at the beginning and what also Ruda, um, I think he quotes uh, Fred Jameson, suggesting that people today can more easily imagine the Earth being hit by a comet than a kind of a radical transformation of the social political um, reality coordinates of our everyday life. Uh, things will never really change from within, only a radical catastrophe can save us from ourselves, so to say. Which is also where there is a, why there is a significant ambivalence surrounding the expectations of such an end, and many choose to cheer the prospect of some kind of catastrophe, the prospect of total, some kind of annihilation or, or, or this acceleration or whatever. So what I would simply say that it is perhaps here that we should fully apply Ruda's principle or formula, or even more than Ruda, I mean, even, it goes even a step further, and to say, but wait, it has already happened, at least once. We don't even need to pretend, act is as if it has already happened. The earth has once been but a nebula completely free of sickness and of humans and of their problems and devices. And look where this had led it. I mean, one should really run this perspective. So it's, in other words, is this apocalyptic scenario, this perspective of kind of radical extinction, not perhaps too optimistic? What if, in fact, nothing, not even the prospect of total extinction, can guarantee a way out in the way precisely that we feel the, the predicament that we are living. There is no guarantee that this scenario cannot be repeated or that indeed we are already living uh, today a repetition of this scenario. To say that very often the prospect of catastrophe is a typical fantasy scenario does not mean that catastro catastrophe is a fantasy. In other words, I think we have to distinguish the kind of actual possibility that it will end up in some sort of planetary disaster from the end of our present troubles as a future possibility in this sense. And I would simply 
conclude by saying that uh, very much like Zeno, we seem to be delegating the change, the end of kind of our social troubles, to another end, which will take care of it in one go, so to say. And of course, this kind of uh, perspective is to be taken very seriously. It is, not, it is a real symptom or symptom of an utter impotence that we experience a social and political subject to intervene in the course of events and in their structuring. So this impotence is real. It's not that we are too lazy to do something about it. But the fact that this impotence is real, I think nevertheless should not let us confuse it with a kind of a absolute necessity which could only be dealt with in the form of the end of it all. So perhaps just to, to conclude in a kind of more um, humorous way, I would uh, suggest another slogan perhaps to be added to Ruda's list, this list of comically fatalist attitudes that I quoted at the beginning. And I would say something like this, the world will surely end but it won't be the end of our troubles. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Elenka. That was a terrific paper. Um, so now we'll open it up to questions and um, try to keep your questions concise. Thank you. Thanks, Elenka, for making uh, this sublime point so uh, easily accessible. Uh, I was just, uh, like, while you were talking, like, a couple of things that I thought and I would want to ask are, one, uh, uh, you seem to be saying, uh, you seem to be drawing our attention to the relationship between possibility, I mean, the end state being framed as a possibility mm -hmm. uh, and uh, repetition of the act uh, again and again, mm -hmm. which which prevents us from reaching that possibility. Or, or, so, would the framing of the end as a certain state, like as a state mm -hmm. uh, or in uncertainty, sort of uh, prevent us from falling into this swing? That was one. Second, then, every time we think we have a choice, do we not, in fact, actually have a choice? So when we imagine that we do have choices, mm -hmm. is that, like, Mm, there, there is, in fact, in imagining that there is choice, is there no choice? Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, like when, when you were talking about freedom and um, saying that freedom should not be imagined as a possibility, uh, you should, like, a nice way to go about it would be to already imagine that whatever you were aspiring to be free of is over, uh, is already over and then mm -hmm. act in that manner. Uh, how, how do you see that in... Uh, in scenarios where uh, a certain sort of legality, legal discourse shapes uh, e legality? No. E legal uh, legislation, legality. Okay, okay. Uh, sort of uh, could be thing, a, a thing that oppresses us and therefore uh, freedom from it and then acting as if it didn't exist, you know, in, in a framework where uh, legislation sort of decides mm. our Okay, thank you for all the three questions. I think the, the first one, if I got you correctly, um, relates to or concerns the, this first mode of repetition that I was discussing. And here, uh, I mean, the, this term of possibility, it really, I think it's directly related to, to this argument that uh, it's much more uh, thoroughly developed in, in Frank Ruda's book. And the, the idea is that possibility as such uh, is actually what... Uh, there is a, the very structure that uh, freedom is uh, a question of something yet to be realized uh, kind of entraps us in a, in a certain logic which precisely not only prevents things from happening but also uh, predetermines the very framework of possibilities. I mean, I would put it, it's related actually to your second uh, question of choices. The problem is not uh, do we have a possibility to choose. Of course, I'm, I'm convinced that there could be a choice which kind of dismantles this framework. Uh, so in, in this sense, there we would have a choice that matters. But the, the way the choices are structured, they are precisely a way in which a certain framework excludes certain things as completely impossible. 
and the, the, the very way the possibilities lure us and kind of uh, uh, induce us in following the logic of freedom as realization of potential, of possibility, of, uh, and so on, uh, actually uh, leaves out or represses or whatever you want to frame it, uh, the very mechanism which defines the frame of what is possible and what is not possible. So within this framework, our choices are in fact limited, but still a choice could be made perhaps within the frame that kind of unscrews, as I put it, I mean, this would be a kind of political act or political intervention in the sense that we were discussing uh, uh, yesterday, that the, a choice that m made a difference and not simply a differential choice, but the choice that kind of, uh, but the, 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 the idea that possibility as such and that if and, I mean, then Ruda has this uh, line that if we simply pretend that, that as if it already happened, okay, I have to some extent, I have, and we were discussing this as well, I have to some extent some problem with this as if mode, which is a well-known Kantian um, modality. Uh, I think it works well in some cases that he mentions, but perhaps I would not go as far as to absolutize this. I think there are problems. There could be problems if we go more philosophically into it, what the, uh, this as if actually means and what kind of, what the whole idea of moral provisoire, of this provisional, what does it mean? Is it, is it simply ideal? I mean, it's difficult to say what, uh, what follows from there. So there are some problems with this uh, as if, and I perhaps would not follow all the way through this modality, but the idea that somehow the end should be taken as something that already uh, happened or that it uh, is a, a way, a plausible way of uh, trying to undermine precisely this pressure of realizing uh, possibility. Yeah. So um, if I could jump onto that one. So a couple of things. I, as you were talking about this uh, formula of sort of the, the compulsion of the freedom of choice, Right? It seems to me that like Horkheimer and Adorno had an excellent formulation of this in the dialectical, dialectic of enlightenment when you know, they said something is provided for all so that none may escape. Right? Something is provided for all so that none may escape. Right? Yeah, so yeah. precisely the mm -hmm. freedom of choice becomes the compulsion. Right? And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But the, the question I was going to ask you is, follows on from this sort of the as if question. Right? The, mm -hmm. the, this, this problem of sort of pretend as if you have already, mm -hmm. it has already happened or you have already finished, right? And um, what I wanted to offer to you was uh, a request to sort of interpret the, the ethics of cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Where mm -hmm. what you're basically mm -hmm. told mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. is to behave, to behave as if yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the aim mm -hmm. has already mm -hmm. been uh, achieved, yeah. right? So I want mm -hmm. to be able to go to sleep I get up in the middle of the mm -hmm. night, I brush my teeth as I would before going to sleep mm -hmm. so that I, even though I know full well that I'm not actually mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. to fall asleep, I pretend as if. Yeah, right? yeah. No, thank you for this. No, I think that this is a very good and serious point. I, perhaps I will just, uh, I actually just cut out uh, one part which, uh, where I directly say this, namely that um, this Kantian modality of uh, Kantian, that this as if, uh, it has its, uh, the problem is, and Kant is fully aware of it, it, this is precisely why he has to supplement it with this kind of a tautological reference to, to duty as providing the, the, the sole initiative or initiative, the, 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 the whole, the, the only trip feeder should be the duty and not, uh, so in, to put it very simply, whereas the us op formula kind of tells us how to act, what, what to do, uh, I think it falls short of providing the push. Uh, I mean, we could simply ask, uh, okay, once I can effectively act as if I've already stopped smoking, the case is arguably won. But the question remains, how do I actually get to act as if I've already stopped? I mean, there is, I think there is something there, some gap or small that somehow uh, there, something else needs to emerge within this um, repetition or, uh, uh, yeah, kind of, yeah, mimicking, mimicking the thing that you are kind of, uh, where you want to get. So, and this is the crucial question, of course, yeah. Um, thanks a lot. I mean, that, thanks for that wonderful reading of... Uh... Hello? 
um, for the, the wonderful reading of Confessions of Zeno, which is also a novel. You know, I love very much. Um, I just have two, two maybe comments. I mean, one is just free association a little bit, but I was thinking in 20th century, uh, you have these different um, domains in which the problem of the end has been posed. Certainly in mm -hmm. politics, like the revolution, can we mm -hmm. end mm -hmm. capitalism? But also in psychoanalysis, so can you end mm -hmm. psychoanalysis, I think is one of these great questions, and also in art. Like, how do you end an artwork? Mm -hmm. You have like the Joycean idea that the artwork never ends, it just mm -hmm. loops. Or you have, uh, I was thinking of the line of Giacometti, who says, like, I never finish an artwork, I just abandon it. Mm -hmm. or, or the Duchampian, you know, mm. it's, it's never finished, but it's just definitively unfinished. So somehow there's this resonance of this problem of how to come to an end. It seems really a 20th century problem to me. I, mm -hmm. Anyway, the, 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 the real question, though, is about Zeno. So I think, you know, you can read, like, Zeno together with a number of, like, novels in the 20s, also by, like, Blaise Sandrard, Thomas Mann, all these novels in the 20s against the background of the Great War have mm -hmm. this kind of fantasy mm -hmm. of the world ending. Uh, and you can also read Freud, in a way, in, in, in uh, continuity with this, with the idea of the death drive. That somehow there was a literary consciousness emerging after the Great War uh, that, that had this kind of catastrophism. Today, I think that emerges you know, against the backdrop of capitalism. But I think back then, it was against the backdrop of, the, of World War I. It's very explicit in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in Svebo. Um, uh, but you know, um, Let's say going back even further, I don't know, for me, the great novelist of this kind of catastrophe fantasy is, is Marquis de Sade. And Marquis de Sade, you know, in um, Marquis de Sade, I mean, had yeah. the idea that the ultimate, you know, the ultimate horizon of the libertine, libertinage, mm. was actually, so not only this kind of endless torture, rape, destruction, and so forth, but the mm. world, mm. the whole world should come to the end, mm. and the entire universe and all the stars mm. should be extinguished. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he even talks like a speculative realist. Like the real aim is that the universe should go back to its most primary nature, which is just sheer contingency. So let's just start all over again. And in fact, I, I'm surprised like in, Lacan has a comment on Saad that's very interesting, where he says like Saad's mistake is to think that, that's, that the second death, the destruction of the universe, you know, comes later, when in fact I as a psychoanalyst think the second death comes first. We're already dead. In a way, it's very similar to Ruda's point. Mm -hmm. so, Ruda's not citing Lacan on this, but actually it's Lacan, I think, who first formulated this idea that the end already came first. But Lacan's point is a little bit different, and I think more subtle. Like, he would say that Saad kind of commits a category mistake. So I very much like your argument, right, that, okay, we could start all over, let's destroy the whole universe, start all over again. Maybe we just reproduce the same universe infinitely, right? But, but I think Lacan's point is that Actually, Saad commits a category mistake that he thinks somehow our universe is closed and that the end of the universe would destroy that closed universe and we could start over again. Where in fact, I, Lacan, say that the negative isn't some kind of ultimate closure, but is a kind of torsion or kind mm -hmm. of crack within the universe. So that the end is not something that comes at the end, yep. but the end is what subtends that very order. That's why he said it's not simply starting over again and therefore we could fall into the wrong, you know, the same mistake. But if we have this idea that the end came first, we would understand that the end okay, is not something, this apocalyptic end, this fantasy of the mm -hmm. destruction of everything, but that it's actually our universe itself is inconsistent. And this is mm -hmm. like Saad's error. So I was just wondering, because you seem to conclude with this idea that the, the fantasy of the end is always, okay, we would restart. But for like, I'm not sure how rude it is. Uh -huh, no, I, I mean, actually, perhaps this was a misunderstanding. I just said that there are, I mean, there are very different ways in which this, uh, my basic argument, what I wanted to say is, of course, you're right, this starts with Sat and this idea of the ultimate crime that would kind of put the end to the nature as such, and precisely this kind of uh, repetitious re recurrence of the same. Uh, to what extent, which is, this is what was my starting point, to what extent we now very often when we think about capitalism and of how to kind of end it or get out of it, uh, we are confronted with this kind of proposals that actually, uh, that we think somehow for me what, what follows from this kind of uh, ideas of the end is that we conceive capitalism as so much one with our being, with our human nature, if you want, that the only way to kind of get rid of it is to abandon, I mean, every, uh, every 
kind of the, 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 the last trace even of any kind of human nature. So the, this is kind of uh, the idea which I would counteract perhaps not so much. I mean, I very much really like the, the Ruda's book and this uh, end as the beginning, but I would perhaps also add another way of possibly conceiving some alternative politics here, which would be to split it with, to split with it, to uh, split, or not the, the ending, uh, the ending at the beginning or the end, but simply to say that there is actually uh, that this outside can be created, but still part of uh, the social reality. It's an alternative social reality. It's not necessarily an alternative human reality, not uh, something that, uh, whereas this, uh, I think there is, uh, as I said, that, that, that this fantasy is very much nevertheless fed by the very uh, powerlessness yeah, that we all experience. I mean, it's very difficult to situate oneself or be against this uh, thing. So this, this was basically the idea, not so much uh, that uh, I, I'm not claiming that this is new, but how this uh, structures, how it is structured nowadays in relationship precisely to capitalism and, and to capital. But just by, by the way, this I also something else that I cut out and actually uh, Mladen, when he heard the first version of this paper, he um, reminded me of uh, this George Agamben book, The Man Without Content, where he actually, it is true that when you read the way he interprets the Hegelian claim of the end of art, you know, the, 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 that he actually makes precisely uh, the way he interprets it, it's very much in the sense of repeating the end, you know, this self-annihilating nothing that cannot, uh, so the, the, there are connections, as you put it, to uh, 20th century and this second structure, the end that is repeating itself, that can be in fact, uh, um, yeah, made in very different ways and in very much also in relationship to, to art, yeah. Close, close. <laughs> but uh, I hate this fellatio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, first, to make it clear, maybe to give, I liked what you described as this possibility which. It's not enough to say that it ob obfuscates or masks, prevents the possibility of change, but that it's even the condition for things to remain mm -hmm. the same. If you take away this possibility mm -hmm. of change, things yeah, yeah. will actually yeah, yeah. change. Mm. And I think there is mm. something of this in the very basic mechanism of, I use this old-fashioned term, symbolic exchange. I refer to it often in my works, so I'm sorry if some of you know it. It always fascinated me, and now I will play a cheap multiculturalist, which I'm not. I would like to know if with you in India you have the same mechanism. Maybe we in Europe, we have a mechanism of, I cannot call it otherwise, that uh, offers made to be rejected, or a possibility which has to be evoked, although we all know or expect that it will not be used. For example, just two examples that are again often used. If, let's say, I compete for a job with my friend, my friend wins. But it's considered a kind of obligatory ritual in my country then. Then the friend has to step to me and say, I'm sorry that I won't listen. I think you deserved it. Should I step down and give you the job? And of course you are supposed to reject it. And no, that's the mystery. We both know it's a fake. Because the worst thing I can do is to tell him, okay, fuck off, I will take the job. It's the end. But we have to go through this gesture. Or a more classical example. I wonder if it works the same in your culture. Let's say I am rich, you are poor. Let's say. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not. I would like to say. Because you know today, to be very rich, then it's easy to play this charity. Bill Gates, oh, I care for the... Or, yes, I would prefer to have 50 billions and then play this game. But what I want to say is that let's say I invite you out for dinner. We both know 
that I will pay. But again, in my country, when the bill arrives, you, as my guest, you have to insist a little bit. No, no, I will pay. And we both know it's fake, in the sense that, because I did once, so you will see that I'm really an evil creature, just to embarrass my friend, who I, kn I knew he was without money. I said, okay, then you pay. And you know, he started, it was night. You know. But what fascinates me is, you see how we all know what will happen. But we have to go through this gesture of evoking an empty possibility. And I claim that something like this is always the basis of our even political choices. The true formula, not only of totalitarianism, but also in a more subtle way of our democratic regimes, is a formula that I would put it like this. You are free to choose, and then, in brackets, on condition that you make the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I'm not saying this is some evil totalitarianism. Mm. There is something in the very basis of our symbolic order that... So again, what you were describing, it's not just some... That's what I wanted. I'm sorry for taking your time to render visible how You did not describe some extreme, eccentric possibility, but these choices which function like yeah. this are absolutely part absolutely part of our daily life. And I love all those deep mechanisms where they function in the opposite way. For example, sometimes, oh, ideology is such a nice thing, the only way to make a demand, it's not only that you avoid a choice for not making it, but also that something that it would be impolite to ask for it directly, you just ask for it as a possibility. And my son, who is, believe it or not, more evil than me, he knows how to play this game. Like once I asked him, could you pass me sugar? He said, yes, I can, and did nothing. <laughs> but then he pretended, he said, ah, I thought you were just asking me if I can. Ah, you won't really. Why didn't you say that you really won't? Or he embarrassed me all the time. Friends call the phone, he picks up the phone. Could you pass me Professor Zizek? My son says, yes, I can. And then, ah, you really want, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> if we understand this enigma, which is in a way, I'm speculating now, going together to that Aaron Schuster's anti-working class metaphoric of, sorry, of, you know, debt exchange. That's the whole mystery at a different level of what, sorry, it's my problem with you. <laughs> of, uh, because I envy you, you wrote a good book. <laughs> of, of, of potlucks, you know that logic of so-called primitive exchanges, you know, like one tribe invites another tribe, they eat like pigs, then later the other tribe invites the first tribe, but the mystery is that it is an exchange, but it is absolutely prohibited for it to directly appear as an exchange. The first tribe has to do it as if it's just doing a pure act of generosity, and it has to be returned in the same way. And that's where I would agree maybe with you a little bit. I never agree with you, Aaron. When you said <laughs> how money destroys social relations, no, it's the existence of non relate because in so-called primitive, which means in this case more civilized societies, you don't need money, it's just this, I give you a gift, you give me a gift. And the worst insult in such, under quotation mark, primitive society would be for you to return the gift to me immediately. But in money, with money, you do exactly this. And we all know that this delay in gifts which created that, it's what holds social link and civilization together. But again, with money, you don't have this gap. It all happens immediately. You give me money, I give you the stuff or whatever. Second thing, and very, I have ten other things, I will not bore you with them. It's also important what you said and you about this, I hope you got it correctly, about this uh, second death and so on. Uh, namely, uh, you know what Saad is talking about. Here you have a radical shift in Marquis de Saad's work. First, Saad just claims that we should kill torture because it's part of natural cycle. 
you know, nature is not just generation, it's also destruction. So this is the materialist side. So we, as part of nature, should imitate gentlemen here? Are you sure? Anyone else?
Ireland on the ballot were actually never voted in the end for Gandhi and those people who did vote in India who wrote um, like there are a bunch of different people who write and it's not a presidential system so the whole idea that we were never set up to actually vote by one person at prime minister level to send you know policies to the parliament in fact that entire choice has been forgotten and the entire debate was structured around well we don't have any other viable system um, so that definitely needs to politically work the same way as it has to work now yes 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 of null votes, which not everybody really understands, but uh, I mean that's my take on it, but uh, 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 with regard to who will count, yeah, I think uh, there is another uh, uh, modus, uh, I mean star, star, photo cover, and so this idea of numbering, so the Indian society is numbering, uh, which has some relationship with the idea of is secondary, I think first to survive. That's that's my response to that. Yeah, and, and just just one minute I have to uh, make a very small request that you grant me uh, so uh, I know about the Red and Sunday Lunch. The act of starting smoking starts with an act of catastrophe where you didn't want to smoke, but you take it up. And say you come from a belief that uh, you know, smoking is uh, a sin, and then you take it up. So it's a different kind of catastrophe. So how, how does then one kind of uh, relate to it in terms of beginning the act with catastrophe? And does is it still possible yeah. for the for it to end with the catastrophe, or, or, the, or the whole act becomes a, a prolonged catastrophe? I think perhaps there are two different questions here. Because one, uh, I mean, the way the smoking is just a kind of empirical thing put here in a structural place that I was describing, which is uh, the fact that I, I don't. It's even spelled out in the novel. The, the, the problem of Zeno is not even smoking. It is this obsession with sickness, health. I mean, this is why he's obsessed by trying to quit smoking because he associates the sickness and the to, to cigarettes and this is why he wants to quit. So, and my point was simply that this kind of a obsession with uh, putting an end to some kind of sickness that you cannot get rid of any other way, then kind of 
becomes, uh, once he ends this analysis, he becomes this kind of a, um, reaches another level and becomes this a complete uh, catastrophe scenario. Uh, whereas what, so this is not necessarily about smoking, it could have been something else. Uh, but the, the point that you, I mean, this is another structure if you kind of, uh, if I understood you correctly, that there is this kind of a first act of transgression or simply stepping out of a certain, if something is uh, a sin, as you put it, and you decide to, to, to practice it as such. Of course, this opens a different configuration. I'm not sure why this is a catastrophe in itself, but it is definitely kind of a act, we could say this, that um, opens uh, a different kind of, I mean, a logic to be formulated from that point uh, on. If it's not, I mean, it could be simply a logic of a simple transgression saying, okay, I'm uh, trying to find or define your identity in opposition to this. It could be, I, I mean, this is, it's different to stay on this completely abstract level. I mean, if it's a sin, why do you commit it? Do you, is it, I mean, it could be a strong uh, kind of atheist political, I mean, I, I don't, I'm a little bit lost at no, what... I, I, I got your point that uh, smoking is standing in for sickness. So it's, yeah. it's something uh, uh, I have, you know, I, I don't have full control over. It's a sickness, I want mm -hmm. to get rid of it. But often catastrophes are, uh, they stand in for other catastrophes. Mm -hmm. An early catastrophe to end, we create mm -hmm. or we get into a new catastrophe. And relationships are a very good example of that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so catastrophic relationship, you do another act or you do mm -hmm. something else, whether it's an act of severance or even this decision to stay with it, often mm -hmm. ends up in, uh, you know, can end, can end up mm -hmm. in catastrophe. So, so that uh, makes me think that, you know, is this a kind of, uh, is, isn't it a kind of a very, uh, almost uh, a very, uh, hopeless scenario where, you know, a catastrophe is being replaced by another catastrophe. So are we actually looking for solution? Or are we just looking mm -hmm. to uh, just perpetuate catastrophe and change the anatomy of or, or the kind of the, uh, the exterior of it or, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. rather than actually getting away from the whole idea of catastrophe? Yeah, no, I think that if, if I understand you correctly, I think that definitely one way of looking at this uh, repetition as repetition of the end is precisely uh, as repetition of catastrophe. And of course, one of Freud's uh, major examples of this compulsive repetition is precisely people who end up in the same relationships. Every, I mean, they end it and then start something new and they, it, ends, it always ends up in the same way. So you can say that this is a repetition of catastrophe. Uh, but then there is also this kind of uh, other notion of catastrophe, which is supposed to deliver us of this repetition of catastrophe. You know, that this kind of uh, ultimate horizon when this would, uh, this repetition would, we delegate uh, kind of a solution to this repetition of catastrophes to another kind of even bigger catastrophe, which would kind of prevent uh, this compulsive repetition to go on. And this is the, 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 the kind of scenario, fantasy scenario that, that I was discussing at the end. But of course, also suggesting that perhaps this is not a good way to go about it and that this is not the, the solution, but it, it's precisely uh, delegating the solution to, to an kind of some kind of uh, yeah, more imaginary um, rearticulation of this ending or something like this. And for me to something else, some other kind of difference should appear. Not, it's not at the end, it won't happen at the end of anything. It will happen uh, in the middle of something and here, and something like this. So. Okay, I'm supposed to be, play the role of castrator, but I actually am really fascinated by the conversation. How much time do we have? Uh, yeah, I mean, if it's up to me, then keep going. Okay, um, yeah. Hold on.
Excuse me, sir. Excuse no, me, sir. Um, no. It's very hard to uh, hear to, because uh, of hear, the speed, yeah, yeah. Um, at least for the I don't hear, uh, not native uh, oh, English sorry. speakers. Yeah. Uh, that's one uh, one way of happens. At certain times, even if the equality is there, like assume they are from the same community, still one loses. They some most of the time we go back to maybe our uh, natural roots. I think maybe I didn't deserve that job, so we don't offer generally. We get into that uh, psyche. I mean, okay, maybe he was good, maybe he was fair. Uh, we don't. I'm not talking here uh, com uh, about qualifications, but I just assume that maybe fair. Maybe he's he speaks well. You know, I'm not a credentials. We get into other types of credentials at times. You know, I though I'm qualified, but uh, he puts it very well, and so he deserved the job. I mean, there are different ways. We uh, subdue ourselves and we go ahead. So you know. Yeah, yeah. So that's okay. Um, that's what I'm also. We have, I, I don't mind. What I'm saying, I find a way out of it. You know, of my losing my job. You know, I find a way out, and I subdue myself. I don't. Uh, even if he's a friend or not, I just find other ways to uh, subdue myself. The aggravation, if at all. I mean, you're assuming that there should be an aggravation, but I'll say ki, I don't allow it to arise only. I just assume. There is a better job which is waiting for me. That's the reason I didn't get this job. I mean, we get into okay. That. Well, um, there yeah. seems to be disagreements within the audience. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I wanted to respond to this as well because I've lived between India and the U.S. for the last decade, and I think that the essential difference between these two societies and the very essence and fabric of Indian society is a collectivist society that we function as a group and not as an individual. And so I found a lot of times, and sometimes in my closest relationships, be it friends, family, uh, you know, colleagues, that a lot of times my, the thoughts, attitudes, and feelings of the individual don't matter. You know, so there's very little direct conversation about anything. So, <laughs> you know, a lot of it is through suggestion, and you can assume that by someone's absence from your life over a period of time, that makes you think about what went wrong. Maybe you said something, maybe you did something, maybe you took something away from them that you shouldn't have. But it's through kind of, and maybe it's because we believe in karma and the, <laughs> in the afterlife that we kind of accrue, the, let these feelings accrue over a period of time. And, some, and sometimes you come back together and sometimes you don't. Because the thing is that the feelings of the individual are sublimated in the group. And so sometimes when you directly say something to someone or you apologize, it could be taken as an insult. But I think we have to, we have to start, I mean. Okay, so then finally we get um, Sorry. Uh, John. Oh, wait, did yeah. you want no, 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 I thought, no, okay. What? Again. No. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, okay, sorry, do you hear me now? But I shout it out. I am so sad, but I know we don't have time more for it because Mr. Wander promised first shame. You know, in my country, also shame enters. Let's say, which wouldn't have happened, with you, I win, you lose. But I would offer you my job because I would have felt ashamed. For probably it wasn't just that I won. So shame also. I, I would try to contrast shame versus guilt. Because the, in the US, there is a such thing, sister delusion. Guilt being an individualistic you know, yeah. uh, addiction, yeah. so to say. Uh, while shame is more of a kind of a social construct. No, I, I see your point. Yes. Well, okay. In a new society, shame is a primary okay. emotion. Okay. Uh, I get it. I will be very short now. What, uh, you know what's, uh, what I was trying to draw attention to and link to Alenka's topic? It's another problem which fascinated me. We have in every society, but maybe it functions differently in different countries, but generally, we have certain normativity, rules. But it's bullshit. You have them everywhere. What specifies human society is that rules are never rules alone. You have then a complex set of unwritten rules which tells you which rules are you expected to violate. For example, in our decadent Europe, already when I was young, 
all sexual prohibitions were really calls to violate them. You know, when a young girl was told, beware of the boys, which means seduce them by the Okay, so we have to stop now. Um, John, did you have a question? Okay. Okay, so I, any final okay. remarks? And then we can c continue. <laughs> we can continue during tea time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alenka. And. Uh,